Hello everybody, Ian here on an incredible Tuesday afternoon. This is one of the first two weeks that we have for the Local Heroes episodes on All Access Live. And uh, before I get started talking about my local hero, I want to think about the heroes that have supported me from this last year. I have two of them here in the Portland area. There are Five Star Guitars based in Beaverton, Oregon. You can see that logo right there. Five Star is based uh, not only in Oregon, so you can get no sales tax applied to your discounts, but you can also go to the link below, fivestarguitars.com slash Live. Enter the promo code of allaccess 15 and you're going to save 15% off everything you see there. So once you do that, they'll know that you supported me, and I will appreciate the support of them. So go to fivestarguitars.com slash Live and let them know I sent you. I also want to thank Rhythm Traders. Rhythm Traders is the greatest collection of drums, equipment, uh, percussion. They do lessons, they do repairs. So all of the rock stars that come through know that if they're going to do a drum clinic, they go to Rhythm Traders. If you're looking to get repairs done on that old drum kit or you want to buy something new, go to RhythmTraders.com. Let them know I sent you and you'll save 10%. And again, since they're in Oregon, no sales tax. So saved a bunch of money and you're supporting my show, which I definitely appreciate. Now, before I continue, I want you to do me a favor. If you're watching this on anything else other than YouTube, go to the link below. Go to youtube.com slash allaccesslive with Kevin Rankin. It's a mouthful, but I'll leave it here so you can actually write it down. Go to that YouTube channel, subscribe, and hit the bell that lets you notify, be notified when I have future guests. You can go back through and look at the 240 episodes I already have up there. Incredible guests, people like Tawny Katane. I did the last episode of uh, Tawny's before she actually unfortunately passed away, but uh, it was a heartfelt episode and um, lots of great memories there. Um, rock stars like Rudy Sarzo and uh, incredible drummers like Kenny Aronoff. Lots of great rock stars out there. So if you go to YouTube, check out the channel below and uh, subscribe. I would appreciate it. If you want to become a member and support this channel, you can actually do so there too. Um, for a nominal fee, I believe $2.99, and uh, you can do a monthly membership. Um, you'll be uh, you'll have a limited number and a sort of all access view to some of the important episodes I have, like the Corey Glover episode I just did. Um, I did that episode released only to members at first, so you get first glimpse, and uh, you get special shout outs and special treatment. Plus, I give away some local passes for some great rock shows. I've got some autographed merchandise and gift certificates from Rhythm Traders. So become a member by going to that YouTube channel and you can do that. Now, if you want to support me a different way, let's do this. If you have Venmo, I'm going to put this little graphic up here. And with your phone, you can scan this graphic right there. Go to at Kevy Metal and you can support the channel. If you need, I can give you a little some more support. Check that out. A little Venmo link at Kevy Metal. You can support the channel by just throwing me a buck if you want. And I hate to beg, but it's nice to be able to get support from my friends. I've been giving this away for a couple years now, almost, and uh, I don't mind doing it for free. It's all great. But if you feel like it's worth it to you, then throw me a buck and I'll keep it coming. All right. So we're talking local heroes. And let me tell you about uh, my next guest. Um, Buko has been in this area much longer than I have. When I first moved to Portland in 94, um, there was a publication called Two Louis, based on Louis Louis, the old Kingsman song. Um, the founder of that magazine um, really wanted to showcase a lot of regional artists. And um, there's a rock and roll photographer that has shot the greatest rock musicians that I've ever seen. And fortunately, I got uh, involved in some bands that he was a part of um, in many ways. So the dude's got stories, stories beyond all. And uh, I'm just going to let him share them with us right now. So if you have any chat or any questions or memories about Buko and you want to throw them here on the chat, do it on the YouTube channel. That's the best way. But I can see you here on Twitch. I see you live on Twitch. I see you on Facebook. Um, so we're here. And please let me welcome what's happening, Buko. There he is. <laughs> Good to see you, buddy. Hey, it is. You know. Had I had a little more time, I could have taken off my five-star guitarist hat. And we have a very similar hairstyle and color right now. So let's see if I can do this. Look at that. And I can go put on my glasses. <laughs> now. Yeah, man. It's like my tribute to Buko. Awesome. Yeah. But, uh, you know, they're sponsors. I got to support them, right? So right. anyway, man, um, thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Oh, look at this. My favorite color on the planet. You got the purple. Oh, no. It looks purple to me, but um, 
Yeah, it does. Got to adjust the color. But Con congratulations. This is a first generation LA Rams. Congratulations on, uh, on this uh, wild card success. I really, really do hope that uh, this next round, you know, that you that you do it, and make it to the NFC Championship. It's where. Uh, how cool would it be for you guys and the 49ers to show up in the NFC Championship together? Would that be rad? Well, that'd be cool. Yeah. Um. I just want to make sure that they get their first Super Bowl in the new building. Yeah, yeah. Well, my son's a 49ers fan, and right now he's pretty excited, but he doesn't think he's going to be able to get past Green Bay. So we'll see. But, uh, yeah. you know, we don't need to be talking football since my Seahawks no, are. No, 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 no. So, um, first of all, I appreciate you having your Tommy Thayer picture back there. I recognize that from the cover of Two Louis that you shot a while back. Mm -hmm. and you and Tommy go back much, much farther than his time with Kiss, though. I know. Oh, yeah. I, uh, well, I ran into him at first with the uh uh doing black and blue right at uh i think it was in the orange peel is where i first ran into him. the orange peel where is that the orange peel um i think it's a laundromat now in the hillsdale shopping center oh my god um, it was the downstairs i think okay and then upstairs was something else but um uh, it was a cool and, and, little club, and you know, they, they, and, and that's when the bands would play for like five hours a night, seven days okay. a week. The, uh, yeah, um, and so that was he was it was currently black and blue. He wasn't doing um, movie star or, or whatever with Jamie at that point. Was he Actually, in the band? You know, now that you now that you bring it up, movie star was before. Okay, yeah, black and blue. Yep, and. That black uh, movie star was the first band, and then black and blue. But it was it was pretty close. Okay, right on. I, you know, um, I had incredible episodes with uh, Pete Holmes on the show where he talked a lot about those formative years in the Sunset Strip area when he went down there and the band got signed. But tell me about the days when you saw you mentioned seeing them at the Orange Peel, when you would see movie star and black and blue prior to them getting signed. Did you have any idea that? they were going to go on to do what they'd done in, in rock and roll success? Um, yeah, they had that air about them. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I, I remember talking to him backstage at the uh, uh, Orange Peel. Okay. A little tiny room. And, uh, you know, they're talking about how, how badly our fashion was still up here in in uh oregon okay we were all still wearing bell bottoms and you know, they had their they had their tight you know skin tight jeans all you know straight legs all the way down yeah they weren't spandex yet at that point i remember they went spandex later on right but well they were spandex in the very beginning and then they went to the blue jeans okay yeah and i think everybody in portland was spandex especially the and then you got Matt McCourt and Wild Dogs, and right. they were all spandex. And and uh, I I was working with the band Crisis, and they were all spandex. And, really? And that that was just yeah. Well, that what was that? 1980, 1981, okay. 82. And uh, then they started going more back to the jeans, you know, the Led Zeppelin. Uh, you know. So you, you actually, um, you were talking about working with them. For people that don't know, if you've been anywhere near the Portland music scene in the last 40 some odd years, um, you may have seen this man's work and didn't even realize it. Um, Buko is one of the prominent photographers that's been around this area. Everything from Two Louis Magazine. I know you've done a lot of independent publications. You have your own publications. You probably contributed to a lot of uh, of other local music rags and international stuff, right? Or national stuff. Um, yeah. Did you ever go out on the road with any of those bands to shoot while they were touring? No, I didn't. Okay. I, just, I, I, I stayed around here. I went out with a couple bands and stuff, but uh, nothing special. Um when, when uh, Dean Castronovo, uh, and this is before Journey, he just mm -hmm. done bad English, and uh, he he uh, 
they, uh, what was it? Hardline had just put out their um, first CD, an only CD. Yeah. And I think it dropped, I think it was self-titled Hardline. Double Eclipse, and actually, was the first one. Double Eclipse, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Um, but they, it, it dropped, and it was like right when the whole Nirvana grunge thing started okay. happening. And so they, it, it, the radio stations, they never really picked up on it. And the radio stations here in Portland, uh, well, we don't play that because it's got a local guy in it. Like Todd Jensen was in the band, too. Yeah, right. From, from sequel. Yep. So it was uh, the Gioelli brothers. Neil yep. Sean, Todd um, and Dean, uh, Todd and Dean, right, and because yeah. Todd and Dean were in the band, they said, "Oh well, they're local. We don't play local bands on the on the radio." So, so they never really got a lot of play in the area. And uh, uh, when they came up to this area to play, I, I drove up to uh, uh, Seattle with Matt Matt McCourt of Wild Dog, and. Uh, Dean was the old drummer of Wild Dog. Right. And he was like 16 or something then. Yeah. Actually, he was in a no. band before Wild Dogs. <laughs> Here's another club that, that uh, uh, is gone now. Um, Wreck of the Hespas was the original name. Okay. And then they changed it to the Foghorn. And it used to be up in the corner of the parking lot. Of where, I think there's a Winco there now. Okay. But it used to be a skating rink. Uh, and that's where the Winterhawks used to practice, or the Junior Winterhawks. And then in the corner was this little tavern. Of course, they had this big, giant parking lot so that everybody could go there and park. And, you know, when there wasn't any, most of the time there was nothing going on in the, uh, I, ice skating rink. Okay. So there was a huge parking lot for people to go get drunk in and get stoned, go All out, right. and come back in the club afterwards. But anyway, they closed they closed the foghorn down finally. This is probably about eighty two. Okay. And they made it they, they were trying to keep it going and they made it into an underage club. Okay. And the band I was working with at the time, Crisis, there was a band from Eugene. They, they asked us to play there. And they go, we had a band from Eugene uh, called The Enemy. And they want, they, they'll they open up for you guys. Or they, we're going to have them open up for you guys. The Enemy. And, was, is there anybody that I would know from that band? that uh, that's Yeah. Been... Dean was the drummer. Okay, right on. And Dean's drums, he had so, his kit was so big that he filled up the entire stage. Oh, of course. And the, the guitar player and the uh, bass player, they had to set up on the dance floor. Okay. Because Dean's drums took up the whole stage. That was my first, when I first met Dean. Was he like 15 or 16 then? 15 or 16, yeah. and because it was an underage club, he was allowed to, to play in, in, in the club. Okay. So that was, that, that was why I think, and I think the other two guys were also underage. God, man. You know, was he singing then too? Yeah. He was, okay. You so know, he was singing and playing the drums, and the guitar player and the bass player were, you know, in front of... <laughs> <laughs> on uh, on, the, on for... the dance floor and it looked so funny but that that was my first uh run in with uh running that makes it sound bad that was my first exposure okay you know um guys if you're watching this and you don't even know that name which seems impossible but for me my favorite thing to do is to introduce somebody to the magic of Dean's vocals. When you put, bring up something on YouTube and you show them Dean doing like Mother Father out with Journey, people that have not seen Journey live and they think, oh, well, that Arnell, Arnell Pineda guy that's out there doing Steve Perry, um, you know, yeah, he does a good job with, with, you know, the Steve thing, but there's nobody on the planet that does Steve Perry better than Dean Castanovo. I think Dean actually does Perry 
better than Steve Perry does, you know? Yeah. And uh, Ann plays his butt off. You know, he's my favorite drummer to watch. It's it's incredible. And I'm uh, I'm glad to see that he's uh, he's back in the band again. And right now, Todd Jensen's in the band as well. Todd Jensen's also. playing bass. Yeah, man. So, that's a, a good, it's a great pairing, and, you know, reconnection with those guys. And both well, of them. Todd, Todd toured with, um, with Neil uh, Perry. Oh, he did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So well, it all comes around. Uh, me, me, and Matt went down there, and uh, we we went and saw when when uh, uh, Perry was doing his uh, own tour thing. Okay. He broken up with Journey, and Todd was playing bass for him. Of course, man. That's and, that, and another guy. Todd. Todd. He he stole Todd from Alice Cooper. Right. Yeah, that's a, a it's incestuous. Another guy that sings his bur his butt off, right? Todd, mm -hmm. it's it, he. Uh, it's amazing to me that I've never seen Todd really front his own band. I know he had like Cadillacs for everyone, where he was singing a bunch of stuff, but I don't think he was lead singer in that band locally. But um, for well, people, that's why Hardline had such a great sound right. that everybody in the band could sing. Right. In yeah. addition to the the lead vocal right yeah i miss that band man johnny joelli i know that he and dean still do a lot of work together as well and their voices are crazy together but for people that don't know who matt mccord is why don't you give him a little history on uh, on matt um i never saw the ravers the ravers was his first band okay and then he put together the first version of wild dog and I believe um, Jamie St. James was the drummer. For Wild Dogs? Yeah. I didn't know that. Okay, right before, on. Before they did a demo with Jamie. Okay. And that's when Movie Star was Movie Star. Okay. And they didn't, and then I think Jamie left to be and do the black and blue. And. Um, Uh, I think Matt saw Dean play in Enemy and said, we got to have him. Okay. And, and that's how they ended up. Uh, he ended up in Wild Dog. Okay. So, so we, they put out like four records. I can't think of uh, all of them. But, uh, people, might, people that don't know this area, they may not recognize the name, right? So having an idea of what Matt has contributed to the Portland metal. Well, Matt, Matt worked with uh, Mike Varney down in Shrapnel. So he did four records that I can remember as Wild Dogs uh, on Shrapnel. Okay. And uh, then he did a fifth record, uh, uh, Dr. Mastermind. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that was also... With, with that was also on shrapnel. Okay, right. Dean Dean Castronovo played bass, drums, oh, Dean, drums. Yeah. yeah. Matt, Matt, they had a bass player, but Matt ended up on the recording playing bass. Okay, and he also did the vocals. Right. So it was uh, the three piece, and then, um, oh God, I can't think of his name. The bass player that was supposed to be uh, Mondo. He okay. did a lot of the live shows with them. Okay, right on. And I never did get to see... Well, like, Matt played guitar. And, and then there were different iterations of Wild Dogs. I know a lot of guys have, have sort of filled in in that spot with different positions, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a revolving cast. It's okay, because... Well, you know. well, Matt, uh, they, were, they were going through the bit of a, um, a tiff, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so... One one day they had the show at uh, um, Starry Night, which is now the Roseland. Right. And Matt was in the back. They were all getting ready, dressed to go, and everything. And uh, Matt was always the last one to go out on stage. And uh, so he got dressed with everybody, and then. The band goes out, they start playing the music. And everybody's looking around. Oh no. Where's Matt? Matt was outside taking the bus home. No. Dressed up as 
Matt McCord with his fucking spikes. Oh my god, why? Why did he split? <laughs> well, they were having a bit of a tiff. So that was it. Yeah. He was just like, all right, I'm done. The heck with the show. Yeah. That, that, that was pretty much it. That's no way. Wow. Did they end up doing all instrumental or did they just call them out on it? Um, I think they a couple of the other singers from in, you know, other yeah. bands and stuff. Man. Everybody had fun that night. That's a pretty they rock roll thing. They, they all stepped in and, and sang the songs that they knew. That's a rock and roll exit, cool. man. That's and I think, and I think, um, I, uh, I think Don, John Teheja. Okay. I, he was the singer of a band called Mistress. Oh, really? I knew that band name. Yeah. So he Down was... in Eugene area. Okay. I... And, uh, you know what's fun about this, man, is that unless you're a diehard metal fan, you might not realize that Portland was so rich in metal history. You know, when I go down to L.A., uh, DJ Will, who's done a lot of time with like KNAC, and um, he knew a lot about Portland rock and metal history. Gargoyle, he was a big fan of Gargoyle. Gargoyle. And, and, uh, and so he knew all the names of the bands and, and gave me a lot of, of historical stuff. Um, prior to me showing up here because people that are in the rest of the country, they think about Portland being like this hip, hip, hipster hot spot, hot spot where like, you know, the shins and the Decemberists and, and sort of indie bands, you know, the, the bands of Portlandia have made uh, famous, but there was a ton of metal early on when I came. Right. And, and I'd heard about like Nero's Rome. I was a big fan of that band when I first moved here. Um, Finn had made a good name, right? And so, mm -hmm. as you know, um, you know, an evolution of Finn certainly featured uh, some of your family and, and me as well. Yeah. And that was the first time that you and I really got to connect and, and sort of uh, get to know each other. Well, yeah, the first time that I ran into you was at that little tavern, that Belmont, Belmont Inn. Right. Down on, and you were drumming for uh, Miss Kruger. Yes, Leah Kruger. And Alama. Yeah. And I went down to get a picture of her for the cover. Oh, yeah. Of Two Louis. Right. And I ran into you. And you realized. And I think a why couple that... months later, you said, on the Alama show, I did a picture of you. Yes, you did. <laughs> you for the cover. More appropriate. Now. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> you know, that, that cover ended up being my exit right i think oh no no it wasn't actually but it was um i did it was close. Uh, yeah it was close I, and i unfortunately i just talked to somebody about this the other day that i have regrets because i was young and angsty when i left that band i remember the uh, creator of that magazine calling me and asking me for the inside scoop and i didn't know anything about asking for some things to be off the record you know and i let no my, no I let my frustrations be out there. And so it's totally my bad, but I, I look back at it and it was really immature. And um, I'm grateful to have the experience because my son, who's a professional musician and he's really trying to go after it, um, it gave me an opportunity to tell him to choose his words wisely, to always lead with professionalism and uh, take the high road when you can, you know? Um, but, yeah. I, but it, you know, there's some, people out there who were publishers in Portland, that even when he said, sure. oh, by the way, this is off the record. I'm gonna, I'll tell you about this, but it's off the record. You go, sure. <laughs> and then he published it anyway. Right. Yeah. Well, you know what? I think that happens in the business regardless. And so it's up to the uh, person speaking, you know, to choose those words, you know, just to exactly. say just exactly. assume everything you say, especially in the day of now of social media, where anything you see say out there is in historical, you know, like placement. You can't erase or delete something that's been out there because it's captured somewhere. So it's, uh, you know, it's sort of uh, responsibility. If it gets on the internet. Especially. Yes. Yes. Take, keep it never your, goes away. Keep your dick pics <laughs> off the web, man. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I have a great one, by the way. I was actually going to send it to you beforehand. Yeah, dick pic? Yeah. There's, yeah. I mean, I hope oh. that's, I, you know, I know that <laughs> traditionally, um, you know, it's, especially when this thing, this, um, 
broadcasts on YouTube. It's probably not appropriate to have this, but we have this one. I was going to post. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I think good. Catherine, it's nice to see you here. Um, you know, Buko, the um, the great thing that I know um, you can probably relate to is that the musical family that we all develop, it's, it's a beautiful thing. There's a commonality that we all have. I've been really fortunate in the last several years to have been, as you know, like, um, you know, in the eighties circuit. And in doing that, I've gotten to travel the world and make amazing friendships that, uh, my friends like Catherine here and, uh, and Rita and, uh, um, Karina, my, my friends in Australia and Germany and Canada, they, they all, uh, are very supportive of this show. So Catherine, um, thank you for being here, uh, all the way in, uh, Eastern Ontario, I believe. So, um, but, uh, while, so I want to thank them for being here, but let me talk a little bit about the historical stuff. So you went through this phase where guys like Dean Castronovo and, and Matt McCourt made a name for themselves. How did you get really involved in the photography of all these venues and bands? Like, where was it that really sparked your interest in that? I got my interest in photography in high school. Okay. Did you go to school here? And here in Portland, okay. I went to, um, I think it's called Portland Adventist Academy. Now. Okay. Um, I think it was called Portland Union Academy at the time. Okay. And I would look after the industrial arts teacher's kid while he was um, teaching. And he paid me with this camera that I got. Nice. And I started taking pictures for the yearbook and, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and I, I, I went to... Uh, uh, bought myself a Nikon finally, uh, an F1. Okay. And it, it just grew from there. Then I went to college and I did yearbooks and, you know, all of that stuff. So I was really into the whole publishing. Okay. And then I ended up going, uh, helping my folks move back to England. My dad took a leave of absence and he went to England in 1980. Okay. And... I didn't do a lot of photography there, but I, ran, I, I went to a lot of shows and stuff. And in that's England? where I got introduced to uh, heavy metal. Uh, and I, I went and saw bands. I was introduced to like uh, Motorhead. Mm. And, and um, I saw Girl School there and Lemmy came out because I think he was uh, doinking the bass player. At the time. Okay. <laughs> and so he came out and jammed, did a few songs to them. And there were these other bands, um, and they were all in these like these small, um, euphoria size uh, clubs, um, like three, four, or five hundred seaters. Yeah, wasn't yeah. much of it. They, they were, you know, of course they were like little kids and stuff getting in there. Uh, not much of a drinking age, and, mm -hmm. and and they were all getting drunk and. And uh, it was, uh, but they're really coordinated with their head banging in England because the, the, like over here, they're more wild and you know, in England, it's like they're all, every head is in unison. Okay. That makes you know, a great, great photo shoot. Yeah. Well, I wasn't doing pictures then. I was sure, just yeah. checking out this band and I was going, fuck, this music's awesome. I went and saw Budgie. Oh, wow. Uh, that was probably the loudest fucking concert I had ever been to. No, in the, um, that's Bon Scott's original gig, right? No, Budgie. They were a Welsh heavy metal band. Okay, a yeah. Tri a trio. Okay. And I remember the name. If you listen to the bass player, you can see some of the riffs that he, the, the bass player from uh, Iron Maiden, you can see, because these guys came before Iron Maiden. So din -din 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 that stuff. Yeah, and uh, Gallup. Um, Budgie, Budgie was more of a of a Led Zeppelin type, but had really heavy stuff, and they had like these soft, uh, nice little ballady songs. You know? Okay, okay. But um, I think Squawk was one of their, and then uh, Bandolier was another one. 
Okay. Um, yeah, I knew like Metallica drew a lot of like reference from those guys back in the day. Red Fan was was one of the songs that Red Fan, you know, yeah. Metallica did. That's right. Yep. Off Garage Days. That's right. Yes. Okay. And and uh, then there was uh, some of the other British bands that I saw was um, God, that's so so long ago. The old brain. It's amazing to, um, to, like, to imagine like Lemmy then, like 1980. That must have been just yeah, amazing. He was actually sort of young looking. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's not <laughs> like he really absolutely aged because he had a defined look early on that yeah. he, he just kept, you know. And that was, um, I've, I've heard so many really interesting stories about that guy. And every, I mean, I met him a couple of times down at the Rainbow. Um, and, what you see is what you get, man. I mean, that dude, you know, he never put on airs and, and it's pretty, you know. Yeah, straightforward. Totally. Yeah. You know, um, I was a late bloomer Motorhead fan. Now, I didn't get it for a long time. And, and then I realized that it's much more of the culture of that band than it was, you know, the substance of just a song, you know, and different eras too, you know, but like Phil, you know, and then to, you know, Mickey D was a different era, you know, entirely. But was that Scott Ian right there screaming at you on your phone? No, that was, um, Oh, that short, mouthy comedian. Oh, yeah. Sam yeah. The puppies. No. It's yeah. a good thing. I have headphones. On. <laughs> if my. <laughs> I love it, man. That dog. Worse, worse than kids. Oh, no. how, how many pups do you have? I have two. Okay. They're, they're, one's a Texas healer, and the other one is a, a blue healer um, border collie mix. Oh, okay. And. and One's a pup and one's older, hmm. and they like to bark at cats and shit. Sure, so, yeah, no, I, that's their job, man. They're protecting cats, protecting you from those evil kitties, right? So yeah, and the deer, right? So um, so we're talking about those the original bands, and you were there in the UK. What part of England were you in? I was in the London area. Okay. Um, so I would go. I would I would take the train into London. To uh, to go see these guys. Right. Well, let's see. Vardis was another band. They were uh, uh, there was a band called Sledgehammer. Okay. They were really good. Vardis. May, there was a band called May West. Now most of these bands weren't real spandex bands, yeah. but the May West band, they were sort of that spandexy thing. So it's about this is early 1980s. Okay. Um, and I uh, and one of the shows I went to. Um, was Iron Maiden. Oh, you saw that. And them. I landed in London two days after um, Def Leppard opened for Pat Travers. Wow. In St. Albans, wherever the heck that is. Amazing. Wow. And, and so I missed him. I missed him by two days going to England and then I missed him that summer when Pat Travers came through Portland. Wow. That would have been amazing to see that era for sure. That band was so dangerous back then. It, uh, it's funny to think of where they've gone now, but you know, bands that have been around, they know what an original band that was, right? Yeah. It, um, so when you came back here to Portland, then did you kind of feel like you had an inside scoop on what metal was? Well, on? I, when I came back to Portland, uh, I, I used to go to school up in uh, Walla Walla. So okay. I went to Walla Walla College. That's and in Washington for folks that don't know. That's in Washington, yeah. And um, I got kicked out of school for misbehaving. Well, wait, in college? Yeah. How'd you misbehave in college? Oh, you don't want to know. Oh, I do want to know. Your fans want no, to know. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I told you, I won't push you on anything you don't want to talk about. And if if they can figure it out, 19, so if somebody wants to do some detective work, I was, I was in school in, uh, it was 1979, and a couple of us got booted. Okay. 
Um, oh, you know, I see. I see questions. Yes. Yeah, well, it's uh, Larry Turing here says uh, I was with I was at the Pat Ravish with Rainbow. Um, it was the very first band you interviewed. All right, so we're gonna go through those questions. Yeah, so let's like, I wanted to know about when you came back here and you said you came out of school and you came back to the Portland area. I wanted to know if you kind of felt like you had a different perspective on what metal and rock and roll was all about having gone- No, over- not, 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 not really. Um, Cause up to that point musically, um, I, I was sort of a, 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 I was a big Yes fan. Okay. Um, rock stuff. Uh, you know, Fog Hat. Um, I liked Three Dog Night originally. Then I was turned on to like Pat Travers. Um, I, I, I was an early Emerson, Lake and Palmer kind of a guy. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I, I like that grand European type sound. And I don't know if it was because, you know, that's where I was born. But uh, I, I also remember when I was a little kid, I wasn't supposed to listen to rock music. So I was, I, my dad was a preacher. Okay. And, you know, that was Satan's music. And all that right. Stuff. That's so, where it started. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and um, so I, it, it was forbidden fruit. And uh, so... I, I, I was trying to learn all of this stuff. When I listened to the radio, I, I turned the radio till I found the hardest rock music that I could. Yeah. You connected with um, it or were you trying to piss off your parents? Uh, no, I thought I was attracted to it. I, yeah. I preferred that. Yeah. And, you know, if it pissed them off as well at the same yeah. time, well, bonus. you know, <laughs> that's a bonus. No right. shit. So, uh, when, when I came back from England, I had been exposed to heavy metal and I'm going, fuck, this is so cool. Yeah. And I, w- I was, you know, preaching heavy metal. I was like, God, you got to be these bands. And, the, you know, I ended up, I found this band Crisis and I started to help them out and wor- work with those guys. And I would go to Music Millennium. And they had a guy there, Rob Bird. He was a big guy. And he had hair down to his waist, long, black, straight hair. And he was the metal guy. He ran the metal shop okay. at Music Millennium. And he had a radio show. Uh, and he'd play all of this new metal from, new vinyl metal from, you know, England. And, you know, the, you know the, I think he turned me on, you know, to a, a, a lot of the stuff at the time. And, Goes, oh yeah, and it was cool because he's going here. Here, you have to check this this band, May West. And I'm going, wow, I saw those guys, and 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 then and I go, do you have anything from Vardis? And he goes, oh yeah, I have their records over here. Right. And you know, and I was going, wow. So that that was actually really pretty cool. And um, I it's went over to his place. Internet. Hmm? Yeah, I mean, so far ahead of the internet. Oh, yeah, this is, That's a great thing about it, right? Is that you had the connection. Well, right. back, back in the uh, back in the 80s, uh, the early 80s, all we had were cassette tapes. Right, you're tape trading. You know, yeah. yeah. And, and I remember the, the, somebody that you should talk to is KJ Dowd. Okay. He's from Roseburg. Yeah. But he did a magazine called Northwest Metal. Okay. And... Um, I think Matt McCourt introduced me to him. They came over to my place and he was playing Metallica for me off of Metallica demo tapes that they had made. Nice. And this is before they did uh, Kill Em All. Right. And and uh, that's why he went on tour with them and ran their merchandise. Back in the Mustang um, days, man. Amazing. And... <clears throat> and um, and then I remember Metallica came back through. I, I, th- I think I saw the last show they did in Portland. I think it was with Armored Saint oh, wow. um, before Cliff. Okay. Um, uh, the bus accident. Well, okay. So, you know, fast forwarding then um, to, to your connection with metal and your appreciation for it. Um, and it, you mentioned getting in touch with Crisis. Um, you've been a huge supporter of bands in, in a yeah. lot of different ways. So 
you mentioned working with them. Like, what were you doing to help kind of get people's name or get their name out there to introduce people to the band? Well, okay, okay, okay back to school. I took some pictures of Randy Hansen when oh. he came to Walla Walla. And wow. He played at Whitman College. He played at the other college. The world's greatest. Where they didn't care industry. if you did risk anything. And I took pictures of him. And that's what got me started with the whole rock and roll thing. Okay. He's doing the Jimi Hendrix thing. And yeah. I, I started listening to Hendrix and doing LSD. And, you know, like, wow, this is, this is really cool. Yeah. So when I finally came back to Portland, I looked up the rock magazines. I found two Louis. And I took a, a, a bunch of pictures to Buck and said, here, these are some pictures I've been taking. And I, I think there was some club bands I'd gone and taken pictures of. Legend, okay. Rising Tide, um, The Brat. And he goes, oh, great. You want to take pictures for us? Oh, but, you know. And then after I quit doing Crisis one Halloween, I said, fuck it. I'm not doing this anymore. And I walked out. But goes, oh, you should write a column about metal in Portland. Okay. And that's how I started. That was it. What year was that? 1984 is when I started writing. So I quit doing Crisis in 1983. Okay. Halloween. That takes us right then to the question that our friend Larry just asked about who was the very first band you interviewed. You'd been fo taking photos of these bands forever. Did uh, did you feel like... The it wasn't Pat Travers. Okay. What was and the? It wasn't Rainbow. All right, yeah. What was? Uh, did you feel like you had a journalistic side of you that was beyond photos? No. Okay. You just had an interest in the band. <laughs> he said, "Do it. Do what you were doing for one band. Do it for all of them." Okay. So. All right. And what, do you remember the first band you did an interview with? No. No. Okay. All right. Well, how about this? Um, oh yes, I do. All right. Yes, I do. I think it was a band called. Even. Okay, and that was a local band that started taking off. That was a local band, right? And the singer was from New York. Okay. I, I, you I know, can't think of his name right now. But that, I think I made friends with him on. We connected on Facebook. Oh, you did he's still, recently. He's still back there, and I still can't remember his name. That's Keith. right, man. They, I, I put you on the spot for some of this, but. Um, so in the early to mid eighties, then at that point, bands in the Portland area started to take off, right? So that was the time like Quarter Flash had already taken off, new shoes. Quarter Flash got their contract with Geffen. Yeah. And I think that's 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 how um black and blue ended up. Really? Okay, yeah. And, and new shoes had already like had I can't wait, had blown up by that point. Dan Reed Network was starting to just uh yep. Just starting to uh, to become uh, a name on people's radar. Then, Black and Blue, as you mentioned, I'm trying to think of other bands. Um, so, when you were taking photos, do you remember taking shots of some of those bands as they were first breaking out in the Portland area that kind of went on to the big national success? Um, I did Quarter Flash in um, the Foghorn. Okay. Do you still have some of those old photos from the very first days? I got them somewhere. Yeah. I bet your ar your archives are insane. I bet you have... Well, they are, but I still have to scan a lot of shit. Yeah. Uh, uh, I wish we would have had digital back in those days. Yeah. Are a you, lot easier. Are you one of those guys that held on to the uh, standard format cameras forever before they went to digital, where you just felt like there was a connection that you had with... Like, um. Well, I, I worked in the printing industry. Okay. And so I, I, I working within the printing industry uh, er, in the early 90s, I was beginning to see that everything was going digital. Yeah. And direct imaging of film and plates and all of that kind of stuff. And so even though that early on, I knew that digital cameras didn't have the quality that I can have with film. Sure. It, we reached a point, I'm not exactly sure when it was, some, sometime in the early 2000s, when uh, you just didn't need film anymore. Sure. And it was, it was just such a pain in the ass. 
Yeah. Into an old dark room. <laughs> uh, yeah, man, but that processing is is certainly something that uh, was time consuming for sure. Um, I was just thinking about uh, you know when those bands were starting to blow up, you had already developed relationships with a lot of local bands by that point, right? So, um, you know, Marvin Rindy, you know, with Quarter Flash, um, John and Valerie, you know, and in, uh, in the early days with New Shoes, and um, you know, right now it's crazy. Portland is a hot, you know, just it's a hub for a lot of musicians that have made their hits and success, and then they relocated here, you know, because they knew that Portland. Mm -hmm. was a nicer place to live in some places. But uh, um, did you have connections with some of those bands where, you know, say they went out and did their success, they toured the world, then they came back and they felt like an alliance with you because you'd shot their stuff early on? Um, not, not, yes and no. Um, I, I, I think having a camera and a photo pass and, and a, you know, media credentials, as long as you're not a total jerk, yeah, you, you're accepted. Um, and I probably got to know so some of the people that weren't metal. I got to know them later on. Sure. Because I was just doing the whole metal punky kind of stuff, the hardcore scene. Yeah. Kind of thing. So I didn't, I didn't, mix much i didn't go to uh key largo okay or, not key largo la bamba you yeah. go to la bamba a lot but i went there if i had to take a picture of something sure how about you know, the so is going to be it you know something okay go down there and take pictures how about the bigger shows like coliseum you know did do, yeah did you were you shooting a lot of stuff then um or like the the, the first, my first show at the coliseum was uh Judas Priest. Oh wow! <laughs> Were you in the pit? You know how you know how tight media is yeah. now at these shows. It's like I think I went down there at ten o'clock, and I had a I had one of Buck's business cards, right? Okay. And I had I had my cards that had my name said photographer. So I. Took a pair of scissors. I clipped, you know, Buco photographer off of my card. Took a piece of scotch tape, taped it over the top <laughs> of the, the two Louis card where it said Buck Munger. Oh and I went down. I talked to the to the road manager of Judas Priest. and said, yeah, I'd like to get a, you know, just started a metal column for the local newspaper and. Uh, I'd like to get a photo pass. Oh, sure, no problem. It's just okay. Here you go. Nice. We'll yeah. have you. We'll have you down at the at the gate. Uh, the roll call. And it's there, in those days too, you could shoot the entire show, right? You had kind of run of show for the. Wow. Yeah, kind of. Um, it, that show. This is like 1984. So. Okay. This is a little later on. But. but still, um, like now, I mean, you don't go past the third song, you're out, right? Like, Unless you got special permission. Right. Yeah. I mean, even yeah. now, it seems like, you know, for the big national acts, they don't want anybody in the pit after the third tune. You know, they've got production and, and uh, you know, they just, the last thing they want to do is have a foot photographer getting nailed by the pyro, you know, but, uh, right. I, you know, not being a photographer by any means, but having friends in the business, um, I would have like Miles Kennedy when he started playing with flat with uh, Slash. Um, it's funny he gave me a, a photo pass to be at their show in Seattle, and uh, Brent Angelo let me take his pro quality equipment <laughs> into the pit, and I didn't know how to use it, man. But Miles was a buddy of mine, so I want to go and shoot him and Slash, and so most of the shots that I took with his camera. You know, I, I didn't want to use autofocus, right? So I'm trying to manually focus. Everything I had was out of focus. So then I had my my tiny little like Canon handheld, and most of that stuff, you know, was was at least in focus. But autofocus is your friend. Yeah. Well, now I mean, I realize that I have a lot more respect for guys that have the artistic eye, and you have had that. I mean, that's one thing about your photography. Anybody can just capture action on stage. But the framing and kind of thinking about where that action is going to go, you really you've got an artistic sense to you anyway. A lot of your, you. your 
Yeah, I mean, you you know, you're you're an artist, and and so your design work kind of conveys that. I was thinking about um, just how you've been able to take that and then work with the bands that you're really interested in and help support them, so that it makes more of your personality. Your personality comes out in that work, you know. Um, speaking of personalities, I love that Scotty Kramer's here in the chat. He says. Uh, Loving these Portland personalities, so many unsung behind the scene and production folks who deserve this attention. That's the truth. Guys like you had worked with so many bands that would not have had the success they had had they not had someone like you helping champion that cause. Scotty's the same way. I mean, he's worked with Curtis Salgado for a long time, but um, you know, it's it's great to see that there are people that just have a love and passion for music and a particular band. So they'll get behind it. They don't want the accolades. They don't look for the handout or the payoff or anything like that. They just want to see that band succeed. And um, I think that's one of the things I wanted to do. The next, this, these couple of weeks um, in Portland, there are a lot of people that have been peripheral, people that have been supportive and successful, that uh, help people become successful in the music business that you would never know about. I had Steve Duarte on yesterday, and we talked about the lighting and all the concerts he's done at Moda Center and Coliseum and and you know you don't think about those things you know you don't think about the lighting guy that makes the band on stage look so great or the photographer who took his personality and got shots like behind you tommy thayer putting that on the magazine you know he took this iconic look from kiss and he's the unsung hero behind kiss in my opinion you know that dude exactly if it was not for tommy thayer kiss would not be around today there's absolutely no way man at least you know, because most people don't realize the behind the scenes stuff that that guy did for the longest time. He, well, he, he breathed new life into Kiss. For sure. And, you know, even before he was playing in the band, all the stuff he did behind the scenes, helping produce the DVDs and doing all the work in marketing and advertising and, and you know, just um, he really was sort of the MVP. I mean, of course, Gene. Well, Paul I did. I, I did do a story. um for one of the magazines that uh, I, I worked on uh, called Flossum. And it was sort of like a urban hip hop kind of a thing, uh, glossy paper for color. And I did a story about Tommy for, for um, that mag. And, the, and this is actually where the picture, the original picture was published in okay. that magazine, along with the story uh, called Living the Dream. And um, it's it's on buco.net right now. Okay. And I republished it uh, in in buco uh, buco magazine. Okay. And so you can find the uh, the article up at buco.net somewhere. Okay. Uh, yeah, guys, if you but, had, uh, heard that buco.net, there you go. Uh, um, I'm 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 revamping it. Uh, okay. At, at cool. The present time. Well, I mean, you've known Tommy forever, and I would imagine that he would give you a different perspective than he might give somebody off the street. If Rolling Stone called him and said, hey, we want to do an expose on the, your your um, input, your contributions to KISS, um, he might not be able to go through as much detail with them, the backstory. So what was it that he was able to to, uh, to deliver to you for Flossen Magazine? Well, I just wanted to do the story because it's a cool story. And the whole living the dream thing is um, uh, it was supposed to be about people who had a dream as, as a teenager or a young person and they just followed their dream and they, 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 they went with it, you know. Sure. Um, when, now I, I actually did interview Tommy before, um, uh, before I did this, I, I did this probably in the 2000s, the Living the Dream story. But one one of my first interviews was with Tommy Thayer and Pete Holmes okay. after they got back from Germany uh, oh, when they recorded their first record right. with uh, Dieter Dirks. Oh, yeah. Scorpion's fame. Love it. Yeah. And um, that's... that's uh, um, well, that's why that's why it had a good sound. Yeah, well, for sure. That was the first, was the first Geffen one. 
It's a great uh, record, uh, man. To this day, you know, it's an iconic one. And people that know hard rock, you know, that that's their in their stable of uh, of seminal records. But, um, you know, the the Tommy Thayer thing is is a real great one too because it did put another side of Portland on the map in a big way. Um, how about some other bands that you've worked with over the years besides Finn that, uh, um, <laughs> that you took part in sort of assisting and helping that you felt like, all right, yeah, I was a good contributor for stuff they had going on. Well, I tried to do as much as I could for other people. Um, so I, 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 when I say other people, other uh, as a music community. Yeah. Uh, so I, I tried to write about everybody that I could. Well, you know, I did the metal thing. Then I kind of got burned out on writing. I had Matt step in and write some stuff for me. Major Metal, who just passed away. Man, Paul Delano. Yeah. Peace, brother. You know, yeah. he, he did a couple. In fact, he did an interview with Rob Halford for me. I had no idea. No kidding. That's, yeah. man. You know, can I tell you a funny Rob Halford story just really quick? Sure. I, I hate to do this, man, because this is your convo. But um, with Animotion, when I was out traveling with that band for a long time, we did a show with Drama Rama. If you remember those guys, Anything Anything was like their big 80s hit. The bass player, Mike Davis, I knew that he had a history in metal because he was originally with Lizzie Borden, right? So he was back mm -hmm. in, uh, in uh, um, The Decline of the Western Civilization, Metal Years. He was in those, you know, that movie. So Mike was telling me, as we did this show in Buffalo, we were getting on a plane back to L.A. And he said, man, I got to go right back out again for the next eight weeks. And I'm like, with Drama Rama, you guys have like a two month run? And he said, no, no, with Halford. I said, what? Like Rob Halford? I said, yeah, I've been playing with Rob for over a decade. And I'm like, you're talking about Rob's solo band? And he goes, yeah, which I loved Fight. You know, he had two. And um, oh, those were amazing bands, Fight right? It's awesome. And ha and Halford, that solo band, heavier than anything I ever saw. Priest do. Two was interesting as well. Two was. It was. It was kind of a, a, his de delving into industrial stuff. But when he, um, so Mike said, "Yeah, we're playing in Seattle tomorrow night." So I took a train up there to go see him play. They were at the Showbox downtown, and film was uh, Dave Lombardo from Slayer's project, and they were opening the band for Halford. So I went to the show. Before the show, Mike brings me out to the bus, their tour bus. And we're hanging out and meeting the guys in the band, all iconic major metal guys. And I noticed Rob's not around. I said, do you guys all share this bus? And he said, everybody but Rob. Rob has his own bus. And I'm like, oh, the diva thing? And he goes, no, man. He's the only guy that's sober. And so he wants us to be able to have our party time. And he goes, dude, that guy is so generous and so cool. And as we're talking, Halford leans his head into the bus and he goes, can I get you guys anything? He was just going to go like deliver like <laughs> dinner to the dudes on the bus. And I was like, that is the coolest boss ever, man. I love that. So I, I uh, just had another round of respect for Rob Halford. And, and to this day, you know, there's a reason he's the metal God, right? So um, brings us back to Paul Delano. I'm glad you brought him up, man, because that guy is another one of those dudes that was so supportive. <laughs> Incredible musician, man. I mean, just yeah. one of the greatest bass players I'd ever seen. And it's nuts that we lost him so, so soon, man. And, oh, and, it just, it, it, it uh, totally freaked me out. Yeah, it was awful, man. I uh, I was blessed to have Major Metal's van until it uh, took its demise last year. But, um, man, I, I felt like I carried a part of it with me. And um, so kudos to him. And I would be remiss if I was talking local legends this next couple of weeks if I wasn't going to call out Terry Courier, too. I don't think there's oh. a person in this community that has done more for the Portland rock and or Portland music in general. Um, I have had Terry on my show, but I just can't go without saying if I'm talking local heroes, Terry Courier to me is exactly you well, know much more right. So, so back in 19, I was a freshman in high, in uh, college, and Robin Trower was in. And I'd never been to a rock concert before, so this okay. was my first rock concert. And we came to Portland. I think we camped out in a field somewhere, uh, uh, Tualatin or 
uh, Troutdale, I mean, yeah. that area, out with the farms and all of that out there. Sure. Before and, and, then, and then we went in, we bought paraphernalia at Music Millennium, back when they had a head shop upstairs. Oh, wow. And, and uh, I don't believe Terry was the owner at the time. Right, not yet. But, but uh, I, was, I was talking with him the other month or year, and I, uh, it was for a show that they had upstairs, uh, Luther Russell, I think it was. Okay. And I go, God, I remember when this was a head shop. We came in, and I went and saw Robin Trower, and I think uh, uh, Peter, no, not Peter Frampton, um, oh, Humble Pie opened oh. the show for him. Okay. And Peter Frampton had already left and gone and done his own thing. Right. Because he'd just come out with that double live album. And uh, that was a fun show. But that was, Terry, Terry had just gotten involved with Basic Millennium at that time. So that would be 1976. All right. Yeah, that's what he started. That's right. That, uh, so I don't know if he was the owner or, part, or, or one of the owners. or Just, just working for him then, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, so let me uh, let me know then. So as we're talking about like uh, these local guys, um, you talked about the Kiss connection and what Tommy has done in terms of you know can, his contributions to Kiss. Um, who do you feel like? Oh, we got one of the healers there. Nice. Good. Good. Can make the introduction. No. <laughs> I, I can hear my pug in Cooper. the background. Cooper. Cooper is that named after Alice? Oh. No, Cooper Cup. Well, I call him Cooper Cup when we're watching the Ram games. I bet you do. Um, Janine named him. We picked him up after Christmas, uh, after my other dog died in uh, 2017, and uh, we got picked him up in Yakima, and it was okay. freezing over there. So, the the day before we picked him up, he went to uh, took a nap in the chicken coop. And singed all his hair under the heat lamp. Oh no, <laughs> little buddy! Like, I'm loving this face, though. I love that he jumps in and he's. Oh, a... he is. He's he's the best. Oh, buddy! Best. Oh, that is a great shot, man. Hi, pal. Cooper, hello, Coop. Nice to see you. Uh, so let me uh, let me know as you've um, taken a little bit of a step back from producing content, right? Um, what is um, I have. I take care of the CBA's website, the Cascade Blues Association. Okay. And um, I was taking care of a bunch of uh, websites down in California, the uh, self-defense places, gymnasium. So the, uh, so they had, like, and that all just shut down the whole COVID thing. Right. So that was most of my business. Okay. So I just, right now, I'm just doing um, the CBA stuff. And I, I sort of put all of my stuff aside, but Two Louis is still there. Two Louis Magazine dot com is still there. And you've been and, uh, all the past episodes, right? Archiving those. That's what I'm working on. Okay. And so I've I've thought about starting a Patreon, um, just to help cover you know server costs and sure. all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of content there. <laughs> Yeah, so you're digitizing all those those old publications. Yeah. And, okay. Um, and and the, they should all be readable with live text as good. well by the time I get done with them. So they'll be PDFs, and you'll be able to look at all the old ads. Wow. Um, that kind of stuff. That's cool, man. Yeah, there's a lot of history, you know, in those magazines for sure. What's a dream gig for you if a band came to you and said, uh, "We want to take you on the road as our band photographer"? What's the the perfect gig for oh. you? Oh, I'd like. I'm, I'm too lazy now. I just want to fly in and out. Okay. Um, yeah. What's the one you know, I love? Uh, maybe a couple of days, and that's about it. I. All right. So, so here's. Uh, uh, we want you to come into Wembley. Uh, we're, we want you to shoot a weekend's worth of our biggest shows, and who would that be? <clears throat> oh God, I don't know. I think Megadeth would be fun. Okay. I always in, they they were always one of my favorites. I, I got some real good pictures of Megadeth. Um, 
I'd be interested to know what you think of the uh, Dave Ellison interviews that I've had on my show the last uh, this last. I'll have time. to I'll have to go watch them. I did I know I did notice today, uh, um, when I, I I went and looked at the list of your stuff and went, uh, and I'm glad I did because I probably would have been worried <laughs> about all of the cool people that you'd already talked to. You didn't want to talk to you know me. None more cool than you. But, uh, <laughs> so you mentioned Like and Megadeth a lot. Um, you, I'm sure you've seen Ellison play a bunch of different times. So um, Dave initially was a supporter of this local band, one of my favorite metal bands around, The Loyal Order. So uh, produced oh. by Rob, Rob Dacre, uh, Jeff Buhner is the, uh, the singer, and uh, he and Brandon Cook are, uh, are leading that band. And amazing stuff. And uh, Dave Ellison and... Um, his partner actually were uh, in charge of this label that uh, that supported them. So you should check that out. But uh, oh, I Dave, will. Dave's a hell of a business guy, and uh, and so yeah. Anyway. It's, 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 speaking of Rob Dacre, um, I just uh, I very rarely listen to the radio. Mm -hmm. I I cannot handle Portland radio. Sure. So I just you know plug plug the iPhone into the car. You know when you're out driving around, I just put it on shuffle, and just let it play whatever comes up, you know? And the other day it was um, Slow Rush. Oh, Pop yeah. Song. Good stuff, man. Absolutely. Like concrete I bubble. Thinking, TV 616 popped up on there the other day. Um, and then some other local. Oh, um, Jimmy Littlefield. Oh, yeah. Littlefield. Kapuda. Yeah. yeah. That's I was great. listening to that the other day, that because I just kind of and all this weird old stuff pops up on 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 uh, on, on the iPhone. It's like, oh wow, yeah, Different old sweaty nipples. Yeah, man, absolutely. I I'm trying to get David Leprinzi on here. I think it'd be a really fun conversation to have and talking about. Sweat. Yeah, you should. And the other one too, the um, Davy nipples. Yeah, Dave LaFrenzy. Um, yeah. yeah, Dave LaFrenzy. Uh, and uh, Brian, Brian yeah. LaFell. He's Absolutely. got some great fucking stories. I bet he does, with, man. With uh, Everclear. Yep, yep. Oh, yeah. and another guy that you should talk to is um, Everclear's bass player. Um, Craig, yeah, Craig Montoya did not want to do it. Oh, he didn't. No, no. You know, he, you know the great thing about... Um, you know, I had Greg Eklund on and Greg was a great conversation. And the nice thing is that the folks that have been in that band that have moved on, they're just great to move on. You know, they don't want to have a conversation. Yeah. About the days. And I get it. Um, I have a ton of respect for all those guys. You know, um, you know, one person that I have great memories of, like I said, um, that you were a big part of you and Janine and uh, and Kyle Neese, uh, Finn, when Finn came back around and um, but put together a new ensemble with that group. For me, I had been in the singer songwriter realm for the longest time. And I remember Kyle approaching me saying, dude, mm -hmm. Kevy metal needs a rebirth, right? So the, the Kevy metal metal moniker didn't really hold its own when I was playing, you know, Sarah McLaughlin type stuff. And so right. to, to get to play Finn, um, you know, after learn to suffer came out and that thing was so heavy and getting to play those tunes and new stuff that we all wrote together. That was pretty wicked. I enjoyed those days. So, um, uh, you know, well, I remember because they needed they they lost. The, I can't remember what happened to the drummer, Lloyd, but um, they needed a drummer. Right. And I remember calling you up, going, "Hey, dude, um, that was you. That's right. That's right. You know, I got you... a CD. I got a CD for you to listen to, and they need a drummer. That's right. <laughs> yeah." You've been that guy for a lot of people, and you've made those recommendations. And I think uh, this town would not have had the rich cultural background of music had it not been for your recommendations. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah. I, you know, that's one thing about a rock band on the stage. And you get instant feedback from whoever's there, whether sure. it's one person or 10,000 people. Right. If you suck, <laughs> <laughs> they're going to let you know, you know? Yeah. Or if you're really good, you get that instant feedback. Yeah. And that's, that's the one thing about writing 
or doing even this kind of stuff that you're doing, um, you don't get that instant feedback, you know? And there were many times when, when I was like, God, does anybody even fucking read this shit? Mm -hmm. Oh, God. And yet, every once in a while, I'd run into somebody and they'd go, fuck, man, I just want to thank you for writing about our band. Because if you hadn't written about our band, we probably would have broke up three weeks after we started it, you know? Yeah, so you were and, like a killer. And, and so I understood it to be a responsibility. I, and I didn't, I didn't view it like that at first. But uh, it reached the point where it did, and then I think that that was the point where I started getting better at writing and doing what I did. And, sure. And yeah, because, because doing all, you know, I didn't have a real interest to do that stuff at first. Yeah. And, uh, it widened. You know, your... then I reached the point where I was editing and I was taking care of everybody else's stuff as well. So, you know, me and Buck, and Buck would edit it. And then I would go through and I would re-edit it and I would find all the stuff with Buck Man. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Man, you know, speaking of local heroes, you know, you were talking about some of the people that contributed. I see jumping in the chat, man, my buddy Mike Skill, Mike Skill from Romantics. And uh, he's got this incredible new album, Skill is what it's called. Uh, I was grateful to play a couple of tracks on that record. And uh, uh, Melinda Hall, man, all the way from uh, Illinois. Thank you for being here, Melinda. Um, Mike Skill, if you've not, Buko, if you've not had a chance to see uh, his new stuff, um, he's got a couple of great lyric videos out, and uh, these tunes are killer Detroit derivative punk rock songs with these huge hooks, you know, because people know him from the romant Romantics days where they had the Detroit sound, but people think of that band being really pop driven, and he's got like the hooks that pop might have. But he's a punk rock dude all the way, man. And I, uh, I'm so excited that uh, he's got this new record that he's been working on for a long time. The record just came out. So, Mike, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. And uh, Buko is the right guy to be able to check that stuff out because he's, uh, um, he's talked about just lighting a fire under himself to get some creative. Poison idea. Yes. Oh, my gosh. From the past. Yep, absolutely. Man. <laughs> yeah, Poison Idea it was one of those bands that uh, um, really put... Self-proclaimed kings of punk. Yep, punk rock Portland band for sure. You know, um, you know another like sort of you know, like king and queen of punk here, um, um, Tootie and Fred, you know, from uh, yeah. uh, Dead Moon. When I was over in Europe touring with <laughs> Cleveland with Stephanie Smith and Kevin Hahn and Alan Hunter... The guy that brought us over had a Dead Moon tribute band, and I had no idea how huge that band was in Europe. Oh, they were huge in Europe. They uh, were. I, I, I would, um, you know, go go talk to them out and because I'd, I'd go get their ad copy and stuff for the two Louis. Sure. And and I'd go out and they'd be telling me about their tours that they were having and doing stuff. I even had them um, come over to the house. Uh, when they did Pierced Arrows, oh, and uh, Ty I did an article about Pierced Arrows, and uh, we did a photo shoot uh, in my old living room. Right on. For the, with those guys, Fred and Tootie and, and uh, the drummer. Uh, yeah, who but, unfortunately just lost two years ago. Yeah, I, um, you know, speaking of Ty, Ty Hitzman, an incredible, uh, you know, music appreciator, a fan. I know that he's like this Zappa. Uh, historian and uh, and a great writer um, just you know ended up chatting with him saw him at uh, this writing retreat in Santa Fe uh, a few months ago Ooh. it was so cool to see him again and um, you know you guys together you know you're like this sort of uh, this superhero combine because you've got your photography and your artistic side and he's got a real artistic way that he writes so uh, I'd love to see more, you know, of combination uh, of Ty and Buko together. Well, that, that, that is one other thing I would like to, to work on with Ty is actually uh, we started doing a, a, a documentary about the Blues Festival oh, wow. um, here in town. And it just never, the pieces didn't fit or come together, but we've got some of the old footage and stuff. And um, I wouldn't mind trying to organize something 
get some of the old footage that other people, Jester has some, Jack, uh, Dave Jester has some stuff, and some, the, uh, there's another gal which has a bunch of uh, 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 old videotape of, of some of the really early stuff, and maybe do some interviews with uh, Delmark Goldfarb, and oh, yeah. uh, some of the, I mean, he, w he was the original guy. Yeah. And um, put, put that all together, and come out with a documentary of uh, in, in the next couple of years of the Blues Festival, maybe take a, a year or two, a couple different years, this, this whole COVID thing fucked everything up. You know? For sure. Yeah. No, I, you know, the, the amazing thing. <laughs> Twin, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Wait, here, should I go back to it? One sec. Hold on. We, some people made comments in the chat here about how we, we're twins. So I'm going to see if I can get... Uh, this uh, this look. Again. Yeah, my green, I saw that. My green th screen's throwing us out here, but um, you know the Waterfront Blues Festival for folks that are outside this area, um, you've probably heard about it. You know the the Portland has this real rich historical um, um, past with blues artists, the biggest blues artists. I mean, and then even non blues artists like Robert Plant have played here. You know the biggest names in the planet have played down at the Waterfront. And um, with COVID impacting things, you know, of course, I mean, it, it affected everybody in a really difficult way. They were trying to figure out ways to still bring that part of the cultural sense to Portland and keep that on the map while keeping people safe. This might be the perfect time for you to finish out this documentary, because if there's a little bit of a lull, you're going to be able to get all those contributors that had content, you know, together for this. So I am. Um, Oh, you know, we were just talking about, uh, okay, so they're asking if blues artists played Vortex 1. Back in 1970, um, right. Vortex 1 Music Festival, I was really fortunate on Saturday to get to play with a lot of the, the players in uh, the musical dedicated to Vortex 1 um, down at the White Eagle. And uh, so learning about that musical um, festival that was set up to oppose the opposition or oppose the occupation um, when America went to Vietnam, right? And so um, it put Portland on the map in another way, long before the last administration and all that stuff. The, the story behind that was that they had a Republican gathering or something or other in town. Right. And they didn't want to have any trouble from the hippies. Right. That's right. So, so they, they did Vortex out on the uh, Clackamas. In SDK. In, um, was I don't think it was Estacada. Maybe it's getting close. Okay, yeah. It's, uh, it's on. It's on the Clackamas. There's a there's a park out there. Yeah. It's, it's not. Um, oh. <laughs> I am getting props from somebody that said that I, I did a good job at the festival. I was just a, I was a contributor to the uh, the thing. But go ahead, keep going about this festival. Oh, the the, the original. Or did they just have another vortex or something? So Bill Wadhams and uh, Sue Brock, from the uh, director for the theater department at Clackamas Community College, wrote a musical based on Vortex One, and it was, oh. uh, it was you know, it was sort of bringing all the attention back around to it. It happened to be completed before all of the sort of fallout, you know, in uh, the last year and and a half. Um, but it's an incredible musical, and they were going to do sort of a live rendition of it again at White Eagle on Saturday night. They asked me to come down and play drums behind it, and it was really cool to see some of the players reenact this thing. And um, okay, and I didn't know much. I, about I, I apologize. I've been to one show since the whole COVID thing. It, don't even sweat and it. I went. And, I went to go see Finn down at the um, Dante's. Uh, not Dante's. Um, the Star. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that, that's. I was thinking. Yes, but uh, I knew that Kyle. So they got Eric Finnerty, which is the original Finn bass player. Right. Yeah. Um, Lloyd is playing drums again. Yeah, Lloyd Caldwell. Yeah, Kyle Neese on guitar. And, and and Lloyd's son is playing the other guitar, which really gives them that nice full sound. He knows all the music because you know he was brought up listening to it. Right. And Brian, oh, uh, can't think of Brian's last name. The singer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's doing the vocals. So anyway, don't sweat missing it. But if you get a chance when things kind of ease up a little bit and people can be healthy in public spots, 
definitely go see the musical when that comes back around because the players okay. and the singers are freaking amazing and it's cool that you know the whole history behind it so um i think uh vortex1.net or vortex1.musical i think is what they have for uh you know for online if i've got that wrong just search it it's it's a good one but, okay uh, I'll, I'll find it but i'll still be i'll be in touch with you after this yeah here's what i want to know um for folks that don't know and i asked you a little bit about a band if they said come out shoot us at uh, at a venue would you prefer shooting a band at a place like wembley or would you rather have a small location where you can be more intimate and get real close up places like the star theater or dante's i don't care doesn't matter no nope. okay um how does lighting affect shows that you should well, if they got shitty lighting they have shitty pictures <laughs> yeah. all right there we go um how hard is it to capture an active drummer when you're shooting live depends how much light i have okay so if you've got great light you can get a good shot of them and it doesn't matter yeah, yeah. okay and so if you if you have really shitty lighting then you've got to be more creative so if i, if I stand over here and i get the shot through the symbols yeah and i do it just right i can get those drumsticks as they blur across the you know that, yeah. just shit like that and then hopefully he's not moving his head too much you know while he's doing the. that's the worst man honestly uh, for somebody that is admittedly just I, I you can't help it man i mean if you see a photographer that's wanted to get a shot i'll ham you know and i'll hold still for a second but um i've had a lot of photographers complain about not being able to get good angles and good shots so early on they're wires. well i will tell you that i actually raised my symbols up so that's <laughs> <laughs> like I, yeah, part of it was so that I could have better eye contact with my band members, but a huge, uh, like guilty admittance is that, uh, yeah, I, you know, I wanted to be seen, and I hate to say that, but yeah, that was a that was a you know that was well, you know that that is part of the problem with drummers; they're hidden in the back, and yeah. you can't see them. So drummers are always challenging, and, and if I go shoot a band, the the one thing I like to do. And drummers do get left out a lot. Yeah, but, they do. Um, Bastards. The, the drummers appreciate getting their pictures taken. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is back in, in, in uh, 84. Um, Raven came through town, and I saw them with Slayer. Oh, wow. In a Starry Night. Okay. So I go, well, I, I was, I was blown away. So I go, Hey, so I talked to him. I go, can I come up and shoot you guys tomorrow night in the Moore theater up in Seattle? Right on. Okay. I said, sure. No problem. So I went up there and they couldn't use pyro here in Portland. Uh, I, I believe they did set, oh no, they weren't supposed to use pyro. They did. They set the curtains on fire. Oh my God. And they got in big trouble for that. Yeah. I'm um, sure. So the next night they were up in Seattle. So they did the full fireworks show in the Moore Theater, which is a lot bigger. Um, was the drummer, did he have the goalie mask on then? The hockey goalie yeah. mask? Okay. The yeah. That was the goalie big... mask guy. And his yeah, helmet would explode. Oh <laughs> Who was the so, most fun, I, fun drummer you've ever shot, though? The most fun drummer? Besides me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I I will tell. Okay, I will tell you this. There are shots that you got of me that you were fantastic. It wasn't your shooting, but you shot from behind, just down below, where I had uh, my spare tires spilling out the back, and I remember thinking, "All right, never again will I allow a photographer back in that location, man, because we don't need to see that side of Kevy Metal." So, anyway, well, you know, it's the, it's the, it sort of goes with the uh, off the record thing. So you say, "If you're gonna shoot back there, leave yeah. the uh, muffin top out of it." Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So don't you have one of those uh, pinch filters that you can do it and? and <laughs> All right, so back to drummers. Like your favorite drummer? Oh God, I oh, I, okay. I just had Let so much fun this. shooting the whole band. We'll see. And I go back to Raven. I ended up 
I, I had this absolutely wonderful shot of everybody exploding at the stage at the same time. The wow. drummer, the guitar player, and they had everything going off. And they ended up, they, they put that in the, the double gatefold of their, oh, sweet. their live album. That's and then a bunch of other pictures uh, were on there too. Yeah. And the, the next year, uh, I went I went up to Seattle again to go see them because they didn't play in Portland. And after the show, I went back to the hotel and I was chatting with everybody. And the drummer, Wacko, at the time, he was really quiet. And uh, I thought, I, I, I asked the writer, I go, is that, is that the drummer? Because you never really see him with the hockey mask. Right. He goes, yeah. So I went over, started talking to him. And, you know, he was really, you know, another guy hanging out and fucking after the show. And so I introduced myself to him. And, and he goes, oh, you're the guy that took the picture on the inside of the live album. I go, yeah. He goes, Fuck, that was awesome. He just kind of opened up after that, and we just had a nice chat. You got um, some cred there. That's it, should you be. know? That's uh, yeah. Um, you know, when I was asking about your favorite person to shoot, I know um, photographer friends of mine that have had just the one shot, you know, like Chris Ryan got this shot of Tommy ah! when Motley Crue came by. And uh, it's the coolest shot. And I don't think you can get really a bad picture of Tommy Lee. You know, the dude just looks right. cool on stage. But um, um, like the iconic shot you got of Tommy Thayer back there where he's doing that. There's just, That's a signature move of Ace right there. He's got the bent knees. Uh, you know, there's just a position that he has that he did such an amazing job of mirroring <laughs> Ace's look. Um, how like Is there a favorite shot, like a cover shot that you think, okay, this is absolutely represents Buko. This picture is my coup de grace. Well, this is one of my favorites. Um, there's another one of Billy Gibbons. Oh, wow. Um, then there's this one. Oh. Oh, wow. Look at that. Billy and Dusty. Okay. Turn it. Yeah, there you go. Turn it that way. And that's a shot right there. Look at that. Oh, you got all three of them. Frank Beard, too. Oh, yeah. Frank's in the picture, too. Oh, look at that, man. That is a great shot. That is so cool. Wow. That's one of my favorites. But I've got one with Billy. Um, Thank you. Uh, and he's got this little braid that comes out. And it was like it was one of those motor drive shots. And so it was like right at the end of the, I and mean, he's doing the thing with the guitar and he flipped his head and the braid went out. Oh, and it just, it just, and he liked that one. Okay. I, I saw him the next day and I said, uh, this is the coolest picture. So he went out and, uh, they, when they were leaving, he went by Oregon Blueprint, and he had like ten of the eight by tens. He had ten of these blown up to like twenty-four by thirty, or some wow. ridiculous yeah poster size. Song. And he gave them to Buck, and so I ended up with one of them. Did you? That's cool. Good. And uh, I ended. What I did was I was trying to impress Janine, and. Uh, so Jenny? the following year when he came back, I went and talked to Billy. I go, hey, can you sign this for me? And then sign it to, to Janine because she's a bass player and she thinks you guys are great. Yeah, that, so, that instant rock red for sure, man. So I had him sign that over. And then Janine went and uh, bought a frame for it and sang it on the wall. So you I know, didn't lose the picture. And I gained a wife. <laughs> yes, absolutely, man. Not only is Janine Buko's wife, but she was the bass player for Finn when I was in the band at that time. And uh, man, she's one of the um, the kindest, sweetest badasses I know. I remember thinking, if I get out of you know out of time with this girl in rhythm section, she's just gonna kick my butt, man. She's a weightlifter, <laughs> a badass. But um, I, um, you know, the, I was just gonna tell you the the really cool thing about what you've done is not only do you have the artistic eye, but 
what you've done in terms of capturing these images in time has made stamps in history. You know, you've created history with what you've done. When I'm on stage, when bands are on stage, you know, you have these memories, but unless you have something documented like that, mm -hmm. their memories are going to fade, man. And it's really cool that you've got something that's stamped in time that's never going to go away. Uh, whether, you know, you've digitized it or you've framed it, you know, you've got it up there on the wall. That's stuff that, uh, you know, Billy Gibbons can appreciate. And I certainly appreciate you know, the stuff that you've shot of me, mine. Um, and by the way, Scotty, thank you. I, I see your chats there, man. And I thank you um, really, uh, man, my buddy Scotty Wilcox there has traveled the entire country following shows and and came down from Washington to Ever, Everett on Saturday to come to that show. Um, I will tell you, the guys like Scotty, guys like you, Buko, that have been a huge part of my history, man, that I am so grateful for the contributions you've made to my musical journey. And uh, and it means a lot that you can share some of these stories and the time with me. I, um, Guys, if you got here late and you had missed a chance, there are some really, really neat early stories about Portland's early music history. Um, Buko's sort of seminal days of learning about uh, photography and, and music and, and the metal scene in Portland. So if you want to know about some of that history, go back, rewind this thing. Can I tell one last story? I don't know. I don't know how much time we have. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Because before you do, let me have me, I want you to ponder something while you tell the story. Okay. I always end my episodes with somebody telling me a guilty pleasure of theirs. So I already told you mine, man. I told you that I, you know, I raised my symbols up so that I can, uh, I can be a, uh, you know, a picture whore. But uh, so be thinking about it, and maybe something that you can share. And um, all right, oh, so let's hear your story. Pleasure. Think about it. That's all right. You know, let's hear your uh, your story. Um. So when you started off the show, you made a comment about the two Louis being oh. a reference to Louis ah. Louis. That's a good story. Okay. And that's the one we always told. Okay. But the real story behind two Louis is that Buck used to do the laver tavern and lounge guide, TL. Oh. Okay. And the him and the owner. Things didn't work out. Okay. So Buck wanted, he had this idea of what he wanted to do. So he just took the TL for Tavern and Lounge and said, oh, I'll call it Two Louis. What? TL. That's so the truth. It really wasn't Two Louis? It wasn't Louis Louis that was based upon the Kingsman? No. But I... we, but it was, it was such a good story. We told everybody that was it. Okay. Interesting. Man. So, you can ask SP about that. Okay. As well. well, I had SP on my show. I should have asked him about it then. But um, you will maybe we'll have to do is just to get you guys on together. Have to do a second. That's right. I believe SP used to write for the Tavern and Lounge guy too. Man, that guy. So he's even got a more inside. Okay. Story than I've got. Fantastic! Wow. All right. Well, I don't mind standing corrected. I am. I'm in. Am, I am incorrect a lot. Let's hear. Um, you know, okay, what I, I will tell you, if you go back to the first David Ellison episode that I did, the interview with him and his partner, his guilty pleasure was that he said, we never wanted to admit that we like disco, but we did, and he, you know, the chicks dug it, right? So um, some people talk about, uh, you know, being big fans of ABBA, which I don't think is a guilty pleasure at all. I think it's a great band. Um, sometimes it might be, uh, you know, ridiculous TV or foods that you like to steal when your your weightlifter girlfriend doesn't uh, doesn't know that you're doing it. So, um, Buko's guilty pleasure. Take it away. Oh God, there there are so many. Uh, I really enjoy listening to Yes. Oh yeah. See, I, there's nothing guilty about that, man. If you're a prog fan. Um, are you uh, totally like early school? Yes, yeah, stuff. I mean, you talked about ELP. Yep. All right, so yeah, so you had the real cerebral stuff, the stuff that was just uh, 
Um, Actually, I, I started out more with um, uh, 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 Starship Trooper, Yours is No Disgrace, the, the green one with the hanging head. Sure. Um, now, and uh, then I, I listened to the older stuff later after I'd heard Fragile and um, the uh, Close to the Edge and, yeah. and uh, Topographic Oceans and all of that stuff. Relayer. So I'm, I'm not as keen on that first stuff, mm -hmm. but now that I'm older and I listen to it, I can hear bits and pieces that got included in some of the newer stuff. And same thing with uh, Megadeth. You know, you listen to Kill 'Em All, uh, not Kill 'Em All. Um, oh, his first one. Killing uh, is my business. Killing is my business, and yeah. business is good. Yeah. Just another killing record. Um, but you can hear the bits and then in the later stuff that is more organized and put together a little bit better. They evolved. You hear the parts and you go, oh, wow. Yeah, that's from that song, but they did it better this time around, sure. you know? Yeah. Kind of and you hear that with, you know, same thing with early, uh, Jethro Tull, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Um, I was you watching might... YouTube the other day and they, they came up with Triumph and I'd forgotten all about Triumph. Oh, and they're still going. Well, I know, but I mean, I'd, I mean, they were so huge back in. Yeah. And then they kind of, you know, all this other stuff came out and you got the new, and then, you know, you get into the really hardcore stuff. But, you know, I said, fuck, I forgot all about those guys, you know? Yeah. You know what? You mentioned Killing Is My Business. Do you know where that came from? That's no, I'm not sure. All right, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to www.accesskevin.com. Rewind about 10 episodes where I had David Ellison on about a month ago. David talks about where that name came from, and I'm not going to spoil it. I want you to go okay. back through. It's a fun one. So if you're a metal person and you're watching the show right now, even if you're not, it's a really I know Dave was really pissed about Metallica putting out. Yeah, yeah. His music. Dave Mustaine, and I and I yeah. should I should say David Ellison is one. Um, he goes by David. Oh, right, right. Dave. Um, so, uh, but go back um, and and I'm I'm, inquir I'm inquiring and and uh, um, requesting that the viewers here go back and watch the David Ellison episode from a, uh, about a month ago. <sighs> there was a great conversation where he talked about where that name came from. And so um, with that, I'm going to, uh, to say um, this episode of uh, Buco joining all access live will also be at that location, www.accesskevin.com in approximately 60 seconds. So if, uh, if um, you would do me a favor and thank Cooper for sharing his uh, smiling face on stage oh, I will. on camera with us. I think he and, wants uh, to go out and see. And uh, folks, okay. if you got your link, you're going to see um, that Buco is revamping Buco.net. So if you go to Buco.net, you can see his photography. You can see a lot of his writing from Buco Magazine. Buco TV has all sorts of collection of, uh, ah. of material. And uh, you'll see some of Ty Pod's uh, writing as well out there. Old archives of Two Louis. If you go to the uh, Two Louis magazine, you can see that stuff. There's a lot of material out there from uh, my friend Buko here. So go out and check it out. If you came late and you've not subscribed, please do so. Go to this link above, youtube.com slash all access live with Kevin Rankin. It's right there. And um, I would appreciate it if you subscribe, hit the bell. You'll be notified of the next episodes that I've got coming up. I've got some cool ones, you know, so if uh, if you subscribe, You'll be notified that I have. Let me just tell you. Um, oh, and you can see the dick pic that Buko and I shared earlier. Tomorrow night, uh, Alex Steininger. Um, Alex is uh, the creator of the In Music We Trust music label. He's worked with a lot of bands, a huge supporter of my band, Western Ariel. Um, he was uh, sort of not only a, a, a supporter and somewhat uh, business manager for that band, but he's helped a lot of bands out in the Portland area. So, uh, Alex Steininger, tomorrow at 5 o'clock. Next week, we have um, the Portland Cello Project on Wednesday, the 26th. And if um, if you don't know the Portland Cello Project, it's an incredible ensemble. 
nine cellists. They have done some tributes to Prince with Prince's former bandmates. They have Tyrone Hendricks on drums when they do that gig. It's crazy. And um, so um, they, uh, the director and uh, cellist um, Doug and Skip will be on my show on the 26th. The 27th, Igniter Podcast and Floater members Rob Bonilla and uh, Mark Powers is going to be on. I know you're an old Floater fan, Buko, so uh, mix Tell it them high for me. I absolutely will, man. I absolutely will. So um, go out there and hit that uh, that link, the subscribe link and the bell, folks. And then go check out Buko.net and uh, let Buko know that uh, you heard it here on Alexis Live. Thank you guys so much for watching. And Buko, thank you for being a local hero. Oh. And- here to me, my friend. I appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you. I, I, I appreciate the kudos. You deserve them. And give Janine a squeeze for me, will you? I will. Awesome. I will. Thank you, buddy. And thanks.